How are you doing this morning? Good. Wonderful. We're in a beautiful town and a beautiful place. I hope I can be on that level <laughs> this morning, you know. It was interesting when I came here because, let me tell you, I've been practicing your system. Like, you know, in the U.S. they use the uh, uh, imperial system and in Mexico the metric system to say, I have to study for the Aussies. But then when I came here, I couldn't really use what I learned because you mix everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, I'm going to throw you like millimeters and inches and I'm sorry guys, it's not my fault. <laughs> I would like to, before this presentation, I would like to start with some uh, foundation of what we do on this whiteboard. Because one of the most important things we do, and I know there are like people from different places here, and we've been working in, for example, in Kansas, 40 inches, at the Brazilian uh, Cerrado, uh, 2,500 millimeters, at the uh, dry tropics uh, in uh, Venezuela, Colombia, six months of rain, six months of dry. But in reality, the principles apply the same way. Even you're flooded for a lot of the time of the year, or you don't like the rain, or you don't you lack the rain, or so on. And obviously, in my environment where we have three months of rain, and that's it. Uh, so, just for you to know that even though I'm a creature of the desert, then we have seen that the concepts still apply in many uh, places. So for us, it's very important actually to fix the water cycle. <coughs> and let's start talking about the paradigms, right, that we all have. So one thing is that we do believe that the limitation of grass productivity is not water, it's air in the soil. So let's take a look at that, um, that how does I'm going to try to explain you uh, how a normal water cycle works. So why is it important to have air in the soil? A good soil is kind of lighter. It smells like earthy. When you can take a shovel, it should, it should have that actinobacteria. Because we have an incredible uh, sense to detect that bacteria because it was survival for centuries. It was a, a survival mode for us. If you uh, if you uh, put a drop of blood in a swimming pool, a shark will be able to detect that one. We have 200,000 more sensitivities to detect the actinobacteria, like miles away, kilometers away. So yeah. So let's say that. Oh my God! They gave me like this motherboard. And the problem is that I never took that class, that drawing class, but well, listen. So you have your, your, uh, your, your soil here, and you have like a grass, right? And then sometimes, I think I need another color. Uh, we believe that the root system is going to go as far as there is moisture, but that's not the way it works. Your, the root system of your grasses will go as far as there's water and air. That's why, for example, many of these corn producers, uh, or those corn fields, when it's a strong, strong air, the corn just falls. Because, yeah, they, I mean, we do, we, 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 whatever you grow corn, you have to have a lot of, of water as well. But what happens is that if your soil is compacted, like plated, the root system is going to do it like this. Even if you have moisture here, it will not go deeper. And what happens when you have a shallow root system? You need to have rains more often. You need to irrigate more often. Right? Take a look at, take a shovel in your place, and then take a look at the root system. If the root system is just going sideways, that means that you have compaction. And it doesn't matter what kind of soil you have. You can have sandy soils and you can have compaction as well. So this is what happened when we have, and then how do we open up those compacted soils? 
Well, that is when it comes to the whole process of uh, photosynthesis, photosynthesis, where you have the, the sun, and then this is capturing the energy from, this, from the sun, and it's feeding to exudate the microbiology in the soil. Because we have believed for thousands of years that tilling or moving the soil is really going to get that compaction out, but it works the other way. It actually compacts more your soils. That's why in a, in a farm, in farmland, we don't actually we 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 don't promote that tilling. I mean, we, we promote the non-tilling. So then you have aggregation. You know, are you guys familiar with aggregates? Yeah, which is like the glue that mycorrhizal fungi that creates those glues that put together clay and sand and so on. So these guys are going to help us create the aggregation here. Like a chocolate cake, right? And then because the mycorrhizal fungi is very strong, plus the roots, now your root system are gonna go like this. And instead, instead of you needing those rains more often, then you can go for a month. And because this microbiology depends on the plant, and the plant depends on the microbiology, then that microbiology is going to even store water for the plant. Because also it's useless when it rains, and then it goes all the way down. So these are going to make sure that the plant is well fed. Plus, you know, you can have a lot of minerals. That's why we also don't believe much on those tests that measure, oh, you have this much, uh, this much minerals, because if the microbiology is not there, the plant is not gonna be able to absorb those minerals. We have been, for example, we went to the biggest organic farm in the US, and they were tilling a lot, and it looked more like an extensive, extensive hydroponia because the soil was only to hold the plant up. But in that particular case, just because it was organic, that did not mean that it was nutritional dense. It just is it's getting away the, the, the chemicals. And it was the tillage, the constant tillage, because they couldn't use herbicides, the constant tillage, that the soil was like rock. And then on a normal water cycle, See, there has been multiple studies, for example, in our state of Chihuahua and even Colorado, because co Colorado in the U.S. is suffering from a lot of the uh, water constraints. Only about 40% of the rain is, is actually infiltrated. Think about that for a moment. If you have 20 inches of rain and you have only 40% effective rainfall, then you're actually only getting eight. A lot of that it just runs off or evaporates. So in a normal water cycle, where you have the clouds here, and when it rains, it should infiltrate first. That's the first step. And in order for, for, you to, to, for you to be able to infiltrate that water, then you need to have air in the soil. You need to have microbiology. And remember that these little creatures change every 30 days. So what happens when you don't have a green plant? They just drop and your soil is gonna be compacted again. So in a normal rainfall, you infiltrate that, you infiltrate that uh, rain, it doesn't stand here like standing water, and then it will go back to the sky, but this is going to be living water. It's not the same, this standing water going up, than this water because this is living water with ma with aerial bacteria, with bacteria. Because it was evapotranspirated through the leaves. Well, this is wrong. Through the leaves. See, that's how a, a normal water cycle should work. I mean, it does infiltrate and then the plant absorbs that, and then it goes evapotranspirates, and then, it, then this cloud is gonna be full of bacteria. 
See, sometimes the most important things we have are, are uh, stations or ranches, I don't know, uh, is the, what we don't see. Right? And then, because everything is uh, carbon, then one unit of that bacteria, it will attract 10 units of water, and then it will rain again. This represents 40% of the water, the small water cycle. So if we don't have green vegetation year round, we're gonna start losing this. Because the R60% come from the sea. And that's in many places in Western US, Northern Mexico, we are only relying on, on this water, which is, is, is actually more, is less consistent than if we have control over this 40%. Uh, probably we're going to have time for questions, probably, um, maybe half an hour before breaking for, for lunch. So, well, but I need to ask here. So, is that so, so clear? As a, clear as a mat? Okay. Clear as a water. Okay, sounds good. So, this is very important, folks, because I think what we promote with this kind of management that we do, how can we extend the green season or the same grass? How can we promote diversity? Because we, as, as, if you have more diversity in your pastures, then it, your system is gonna be more resilient. Unfortunately, the way we manage pretty much wherever we go, we're only managing for five to 10 grasses five to 10 grasses. I mean, it doesn't go beyond that. And I want you to manage for 100, 200 grasses. How are you going, and forbs, forbs are herbs, right? How can we go from managing for, see, when, when, when you're trying to hit those grasses at the optimal, optimal point, you know everybody what's the optimal point of a grass? When it's in a boot stage, when it's forming the seed. If you graze a grass before it's actually forming that seed, you're overgrazing that grass. Because the full, the root system is not ready yet. But yeah, we were taught, okay, you need to graze the grasses at phase two, optimal point, you know, better nutrition. The problem with that, with that approach is that you are actually overgrazing a lot of diversity trying to come up because you're only focusing on those grasses. And that happened, in the tropical area, that happened in the desert, that happened in everywhere. I mean, we have seen that happen in many places, that we don't have enough diversity to actually, for a plant to be green, but also to extend the green of that plant. I'm a friend of, uh, I don't know if you have heard about Gay Brown. Well, he's, he's right straight up, water in Canada, big winters, one meter, one meter, is that okay, meters? three feet, whatever, five feet of snow. And below that snow, there's a little bit of green grass. That's what we want. I mean, I'm not saying that, oh, you have to have lush, big green grasses year round. Well, no. But you have to have something green. And as the plant and the soil really get healthier, you're gonna have a little bit of green. In my, in my that I'm straight down from Gabe, right now, border in Mexico and US, I have, I was able, because before, with three months of rain, my green went from three months, and that's it. Because my grasses were so sick and were shallow rooted, shallow, shallow rooted, the perennial grasses, that when it stopped raining, they shut down. They were sick, they were hungry, they were thirsty. Now the same grasses are actually very deep rooted, and they stay green on the worst time of the year, like gay brown, worst time of the year is winter. My worst time of the year is before the rains. I still have green at the bottom. Now, what does that mean not only for the micro herd, because I call the micro herd the little ones, right? The microbiology. Also, it does mean for my, the profitability of the ranch. Because if I have something green, I don't have to supplement my cows. See, if I don't have green, I have to bring something from the to the ranch because the cows really need something green. 
So that's really helping me to go through year round with no or minimal supplementation because that is all about management. Okay, that's where we are located on the, on the, on the red dot. Thank you. <coughs> Don't go too far. <laughs> we're here. So we're bordering Texas, New Mexico, but the Chihuahua Desert actually goes through several states in the US and Mexico. And this is our conditions in case, well, I guess this year we, we broke some records in all Southern US and Northern Mexico. It's getting pretty ugly because we went actually to 45. You want me to translate this to Fahrenheit? You say yes? I know you don't. And then minus 10 in winter. There actually one day in the spring this year that and the, and the night was minus 10 and the day was 20. So we are in a high desert. Our elevation is about 1400 meters. Uh, when you want some to translate, uh, if you want no, if you want to me to translate something, then just just Google up, okay? <laughs> this is our average. See, one of the nice things about what we do is back in 2004, we got uh, 20 inches of rain. Five months after, we were in a drought because. It just, I mean, we were so such a bad shape that it kind of destroyed a lot of dams. And now, if, if it rains at the right time of the year, probably I only need just five inches. I don't need more than that to keep carrying the same number of animals. So it really does make a lot of difference. See, for example, in 2017, 18, 19, we have below average rain. And we were running about the same cows as one of my neighbors and then he started stocking. And then from 500 to 400 to 300 to 200, I was still running the same 700. I did the stock 200 because now we were in 2020, it did not rain but very little, four inches. And he put all his cattle in the corral for a full year, 200 cows. And then I was still carrying my 500. That's when he made the change. That's when he actually said, oh, I think I, I, I want to change. So that's, that, that was good for, for the region. But just for you to compare how actually you feel the drought in a very different way when you have this kind of management. Um, yeah, most of the rain falls in three months. Uh, just to give you more context, we our ranch is 12,000 hectares. Uh, we're running 500 cows, some sheep. Well, this is, this is what's going on here, uh, in my ranch and also in most of the Western US, is we're going downwards. We provide sea salt for livestock. So we have not used any chemical, mechanical, seeding, burning, 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 or subsidies. Well, subsidies is between quotes because we work with these conservation organizations and uh, bird, from the US, so they fly to the Chihuahua Desert, no wall in between, they fly over the wall. <laughs> and uh, and they, they are seeing really good results, so they are supporting us to build infrastructure and so on. And yeah, so just pretty much management. And now we need 12 hectares per cow, and most of the area I just keep going to. 100 or more. So remember, there's one thing here, folks. We're working with nature, with ma many variables, right? It's incredible, it's incredibly complexity of nature. Is, if one of you tell me, oh, Alejandro, I think I'm about the same as 10 years ago. I don't know if I should believe you. Because you cannot stand still. Whatever you're doing is taking you forward or taking you backwards. And that's what we need to be observant in terms of the plants we're getting. Remember that nature gets more aggressive. As we fight more with nature, it's gonna get more aggressive. And you know who's gonna win at the end? Nature bats last. So nature is gonna win. I mean, we are trying to save ourselves. We're not trying to save nature. Nature's, I mean, nature's times is different than, than our times. But it's actually, important for us to work with nature because you know we have a business as well. 
So nature, for example, in our context, nature throws a lot of thorns, a lot of uh, uh, toxic weeds, like poisonous weeds, and all. those are signs for us that we're not going in the right direction. While on the other side, when you start working with nature, trying to mimic nature, to respect nature, not to fight, then nature is going gonna, is gonna to really be very abundant. So this is a lesson for someone, for the, the people here who speak Spanish. I'm sorry, guys. But well, no, this is a map from the 1850s, just to give you a, a little bit of the ecological perspective of our state. And it says here that the climate was very nice. Oh my God, where's that climate? We don't have that climate anymore. And the other thing that grabbed my attention is that the, the number of wildlife that we used to have. Well, we, still, we used to have most of them, but with black bears, grizzly bears, uh, bisons, uh, antelope. But this is what really grabbed my attention. Otters and beavers, all across the state, they're tied back to water. So even if you see the old roads, old roads, they have to have water, right? For the mules or for the, they have to have water. They're gone. I mean, all the springs and all that stuff, they're gone. So we've been in, in decades, actually, you know, breaking the water cycle and now we're, we're getting, it's getting tougher. Uh, this is the current situation where we are. This is not too far from a ranch. So you see a lot of bare ground. People bringing that, that hay to the cows and a lot of woody plants. Even the woody plants are dying now. Uh, this is another example that we well, yes, asked, this, this ranch has grass, but it's not only having grass, but the quality of the grass that you have. Remember that when you're regenerating, actually you're, you're growing in multiple dimensions. Like one dimension is, yeah, I have more ground cover, more grasses, but also I'm improving the quality of that grass. So you can have the same amount of grass, but if you're improving the soil, your cow, instead of batting 10 times, trying to feed her, it will bite probably 10 times because it's now the grass is better mineralized because it has more microbiology, better, bigger micro herd. Okay, so that was funny because Gabe Brown and Ray Chuleta were there and they were, hey, how, how deep is this? And I have to send my friend there to measure that. But see, this was to be a, a bar war that was put 50 years ago. Think about that. But the interesting thing here is this, still carbon as well. So these used to be tall grasses. Like this. So it gives us kind of a story of what happened, like, I don't know, 50, 100 years ago. Actually, because where we live, we have a lot of history from the priests, from the Spaniards, so when they came here, and they were the ones writing what, what they observed. And the grass, all the grasses we used to have were tall grasses. So they used this, what we call on, on the saddle, like tapaderas, which they cover the boots. And I always thought that it was for the thorns. No, it was because the boots get wet. Think about that. I mean, we have really drastically changed that environment. Uh, this is a rainfall pattern. So we, we pretty much have to rely on these three months. So here, we need to make a decision. I mean, here, obviously, the cows are fat, getting ready to winter. But here we need to make a decision how much grass we have and how many cattle we have. And if we have about a bit more grass, then we stick with the cattle. If we have way more grass, then we can do some other stuff to sell our grass to an animal, like leaving the winners to be stalkers or, I don't know, something to take advantage. But we're always trying to keep a reserve because we need to make sure that whatever animal we have it's going to go all the way through here again. Not here when it starts raining. We want to skip the next growing season. So that really give us a lot of peace of mind. Because even though our rest periods are long, because we don't, we don't go back to the same paddock like in 12 months. We just let it rest. But you may say, oh yeah, 
Alejandro, but I think it's gonna be really very rough forge. Well, is diversity the one that beats that optimal point of the grass? Because we were in Venezuela and that guy did a lot of tests. It was a subtro a dry tropics, like six months of rain, six months of, and you know, the, those grasses really get really ugly when you pass that optimal point. So he got a plot of three grasses and the other uh, on 30 day rest. I mean, it rains a lot there, right? 30 days. And then this, the next plot or pilot was the same with three grasses, but 70 days of rest. And he was actually measuring everything, like the daily gains for those heifers and everything. So when the, when the heifers got into the first plot with the optimal point of the grass, meaning like at, at a boot stage, they gain this much. When, they, when he put the heifers on the 70 day rest, we saw that they had more diversity, more herbs, more legumes, and the heifers gained more even though the grass was over, passed, gained more there than on the optimal point. So just be aware that the cows will always do better. Livestock in general, I don't want to talk only about cows, but livestock will always do better if you allow the animals to select. The more diversity you have, and that's why we promote the long rest periods, the better your animals will do, and the more resilient your system is going to be on a drought. So, well, this is the trend. I mean, we did this with a, a friend of mine who likes this remote sensing satellite. And if you see it in the last 40 years, it used, when it rained, it used to rain a lot. And when the droughts were like eight inches, now when it rains, it doesn't rain that much, and our droughts are like four inches. So now we need to manage for that, because we're not anymore here. Even though I may have a ranch that is all regenerated, but I'm not alone. I'm in an ecosystem, I'm in a region. But the nice thing about this is, I don't know what I'm doing this. Oops, sorry. That this is another, like a satellite image of the photosynthesis. And even though we're getting less rain, less rain, we're getting more green plants. It's increasing. More green plants for a longer time. This is a view of our property when it rains. So this is the house and that's the mountain range. When it snows. Well, we already said that. So how do we go from here which is one of the neighboring properties, to this, which is my property. I mean, I'm not saying that all my grasses are like this, but they are expanding. I mean, they are growing, they are growing. I mean, I'm sure that we have some seed bank in, in this soil. Here, this uh, is a hard pan, hard, hard pan, but if you actually get a, a, a sample under hard pan, it, we will be full of, wheat, full of seeds. But how do we do that? I mean, there was a point in time where I was reading a book on South America, uh, Arno Klocker, a uh, German descendant uh, who was born in Chile and did his career. And I was intrigued by what the book said. Because, and then I called my mentor because the way we were actually taught at that time was two paddocks is better than one and um, four is better than two, right? Regardless of where they were. So I called, because I read on that book of my Arnold Clocker that the, the biggest error that we made in grazing management was not to have enough animal impact. So then I called my mentor and said, hey, Jesus, has been to be Jesus, Jesus, or well, that was human Jesus. So I told Jesus, I asked Jesus, okay, Jesus, let's say that we got the same. Hmm. I don't know if this is strong enough, but let change colors. So let's say that we, we get the same properties. 
And then we're going to bet on who can grow more grass. Okay, sounds good. So we're going to give, let's say, just for the sake of the example, 100K, let's say, dollars. That is going to be the investment. Right? And then I told Jesus, Jesus, I think you're going to approach this the same. You've been approaching your ranch, like, okay, let's split it in two and then in four and so on. And then, you know, you're going to get some results at the end of the year. But it happened that this property has grasses like the best areas. Let's say here, and here, and here, right? The same way there, right? Like you have the, the best areas. When I mean the best areas, the more biomass, the more diversity. Probably it's a meadow, it's a creek, it's a, a, a gully that has extra moisture. Or maybe that big, like that big gully that I show you that it kind of spreads out in certain places. So we had the same base to begin with. But I, I wouldn't really do that because there's a, there's a problem with this approach. Because remember, we, our main goal is to save the ranchers. And the problem with this investment is that it's gonna take a while because you're still not being intentional in your grazing, like not enough, not enough animal impact. So what we did there, I mean, I, talk, I told my friend, oh, I'm, I'm missing one of the green spots, right? So it's supposed to be same, identical. So here, and I say, no, well, Jesus, I'm not gonna follow you or what you're saying. I'm gonna put all my investments on the best areas. And I'm gonna split more because I have steel fence, right? So I'm gonna do like this. So you are actually putting your, your investment on the best areas, so that will give you a faster return on investment. And because we are novice grazers, then you're gonna lower the risk. You're gonna lower the risk in, 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 in different ways. One, one is you're working on a good stand of grass already, not on the bare ground. And the animal impact is, is going to be much higher. So when we go with a client, let's say in the Western US, I ask the client, show me your, uh, even there were some uh, products called Cadillac. Show me your Cadillac, your Rolls Royce, your, the best of your ranch. And sometimes it happened that those are like a creeks with permanent water or something. And I don't want even the people to invest on anything. Let's do it, the, let's take the existing water points or existing creeks or whatever you have already. And then, so yeah, I mean, this actually is gonna give you more yield or more bang from your money. What do we usually do? Oh, we don't like that, we don't like that spot. Split it into marginal return because there's not enough animal impact and you're waiting for five years. Or let's split it in two, you choose the worst area because we don't like to see the worst areas, right? So this is counterintuitive to what we usually do. But for us, it has been really good because when we go to a client and they try that, then they, I don't even know if I'm gonna see them again, but I know that some of them have changed just by trying a small scale on their best areas. And then they see a big change because the commitment is, okay, you're gonna do this here and you won't touch that area for a full year. And they have grown so much grass in those areas. I says, wow, it does work. So the idea here, folks, is to, for you to go from the best areas at a enough density to the worst areas. So you ended up prioritizing your ranch. We may, we may make a mistake because we thought that that area may not respond, but basically 
that's, that seems to be the best area. So that's how we actually approach. I think it was important for you to understand this concept. So it's really, what is really making us make a difference at our ranch is more intentional grazing, like more intensity grazing. And let me, let me explain you something else because if we miss all those slides, it doesn't matter as long as you understand this. But well, we're gonna go through these slides, don't worry. So, everybody? Yes. Yeah, what do I do in like the um, areas that do not have that more grass? Well, on that case, on that first year, because I really want you to have results in one year, right? That is our goal. On those areas, I just keep whatever I was doing before. They say you were rotating every, um, I don't know, every month, you just do the same thing, or now eventually I will probably split them. Those ones, yeah, may, the worst areas, I may split them in two, as long as there's enough for each. So it will automatically be bigger paddocks, because the first thing you need to define is how often are you willing to move your cattle. The more often you move your cattle, the smaller are gonna be the paddocks. Because what we do is we, Estimate, let's say that you say, Alejandro, I'm willing to take this part of this Cadillac, Cadillac or Royal Royce pasture or repairing, whatever, and then I'm gonna do 10 days, what you're saying, right? And then the rest of the ranch, you do the same. But eventually, you will migrate in from there to the worst and the worst, maybe there's not much you can do, or maybe you can split it in two. That, that's where we go back to splitting it two and four, yeah. But then I really want you, see, I really want you guys to work on the best, because for example, one of my neighbors, remember that big gully? He has 80,000 acres. You like acres, right, on the area? Well, it depends, right, yeah. So, and he has these 10,000 acres where they, he was getting all the water from that gully and spreading out. And I told him, we're going, and he got cattle all spread out of his ranch. Well, nowadays, after five years of actually focusing only on that area, on those, those 10,000, he can hold all the cattle in that area. And with no inputs, because what is really killing the ranchers, at least in the U.S., is the high costs. In the U.S., even before all this inflation after COVID, the average of carrying a cow per year is $1,000. So obviously they are not making money. So what is the point of me going there and saying, oh yeah, you can, I mean, eventually you are gonna be able to carry more cows, but if we don't reduce the cost, there's no point of increasing the, 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 the herd. So th that is the idea. I mean, to actually, to, for you to be able to actually grow better grasses, so you will need less inputs. Mm -hmm. did, did he divert the water from those gullies? No, no, the water just gets there. They were doing the same thing? Yeah, the same, uh-huh. Because, see, how we have fixed the gullies in my ranch, and he's also fixed it that way, is we just the cows. Because what happened is that when you do this more intensive, not, not splitting in two and big pastures, right, but when you do more intensive grazing, as, uh, on, let's say on daily moves, then the cows stay there for just one day, right? Pull them out one day and then long rest period. And then that gully is gonna start growing grass. When it grows grass, then the next big, because remember, it's, there's a lot of dirt coming in. It covers that grass and then you advance one step. And next year, another step. So you kind of get disappointed because say, oh, that grass is gone. Well, it's gone, but it's serving you to actually level out that gully. I mean, I know that the gully that I show you is very deep, but for example, we have fixed many gullies are like uh, six feet, I'm uh, sorry, six foot, uh, six meters, 10 meters. Like you can put like a track there. Your tracks, not our tracks, <laughs> because our tracks are really small. So yeah, that's how we fix it. I mean, if you find a place that you're really getting a lot of uh, moisture coming in, like a stream or that's the place to start because the biology works or thrives on a sub aquatic environment and is also actually is what is, is the role of the cow to bring the biology or soils are not working because of lack of biology 
or soils are compacted because the lack of biology in the soil, the lack of that microherb. So it's really, it's really the, 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 uh, the beautiful of the livestock, even sheep or cows or donkeys or horses, because you can do it with any animal, as long as you can control the animals. It's really the biology that they're putting into the soils, the manure, the urine, the saliva, the hooves, and even the act of breathing, it will promote uh, more, better, faster grass. Uh -huh. Okay. So, well, I think I skipped something here. I think I just want to get over this um, motherboard. Last time I heard the word motherboard was when I was at school studying IT. <laughs> Now again, you know, in Australia. So, yeah, definitely this is a better approach um, to get faster results. Because this is as any investment, guys. The longer time it takes you to get your money, the, the more the risk is gonna be, right? The beautiful thing about this is that you get more at a lower risk. Okay, guys, so how do we, do we approach this? And this is where you're going to have your homework here. Because people get scared when I tell them. I mean, it's a context space, the, the, uh, how much risk you're going to give. But for example, all Western US, all Northern Mexico, and some parts of Central Mexico, one year. Even though I got a friend from Kansas coming down to the ranch, 40 inches of rain per year, which would be equivalent to what? 40 inches is. A thousand, right? Yeah? Okay, great. Yeah, Well, okay, well, 40 inches. So, he saw what I was doing because also, folks, we're not only promoting grasses, multiple grasses. When I started with this, I only have like eight different grasses. Now we're approaching 100 different grasses with an intentional animal impact, more animal impact and combined with laundress periods. He went to my ranch and said, oh, Alex, I'm gonna, well, because I'm Alex in Mexico, but Alejandro in the US and Australia, I'm sorry. Give me a hard time. Um, he said, I'm gonna try your, your approach in my ranch in Kansas, 40 inches, and he found like five or six new forbs. And forbs, which is like this uh, palatable herb, flowering herb, actually is like the Cherry, when you fix the water cycle with the grasses, you should see a lot of flowers. And he, he was in a 40 inch precipitation area. He was overgrazing some of the forbs because he was returning multiple times per year on the same, on the same uh, paddock. So what we do actually is this, folks. So okay, you already told me that this is the Cadillac, I mean like good pasture. And then we need to throw some numbers as an example. Let's say you told me that this is a 40 day paddock. The way you're managing right, right now. I mean, the way you're managing right now, yeah, it, it, the cattle do well, you know, you put the cattle 40 day there. And then I'm asking you to, well, let's say that you have, you have, let's see, oh, this is the blue. You have a trough here. And I'm gonna tell you, okay, give me a quarter of that. Paddock. And I'm gonna ask you to move your cows every day for 10 days. Right, because it's about, you know, I mean, obviously you need to adjust, but if, if it is a quarter, then and it's 40 days, then it's supposed to be 10 days, right? Based on the information we have on hand. And then I'm going to do strip grazing. Meaning I'm gonna put, they said that the gate is here. Well, let's look at simple here. You put your cows there, there's water. No need to develop water. And this, for, you see, the point here is that I can talk for days here, but if you don't see it in your place, you won't believe it. So, 
I put that there, divide it into 10, then I will leave because I'm, see, the first thing we need to see, we, we need to define is, okay, I'm willing to move it every day. I already have control of my cattle. They're not gonna be messing up that friends when they get in. There's gonna be some stress, obviously, because they're not used to more competitive environment. How big is the paddock? Well, there are different ways to measure that, to estimate that. Like four people saying, okay, is that enough for one cow? No, open up, open up, open up. Okay, that's enough, right? And then you multiply with the number of cattle, and you get the acreage or the hectares. But because we're new to this, then we're gonna go in the afternoon and check it out. If we measure, if not, then we just open up a little bit more and then that's why it's more an art of observing more than a science. I cannot give you a formula because there's no formula and it could change during the rainy season, it could change during the dry season, but enough for the cows to be happy, to be full. Because if you go the next day, obviously there will be some stress, but for us, we move twice a day. But let's say we're moving once a day. We go in the morning. We first of all, we go and check, the, check on the horse, how things are looking alike. And then we build, we, we build those uh, strips, those paddocks, based on the number of cattle and based that it will be more than they need. Next morning, most of the cows will be laying down that's like an indicator that they're full. So they, you split this into 10 parts. So let's say that you, you were okay here, then you build another one, and then another one, and another one, until you're done for 10 days. So there's no back fence to the water. They go back to the same water. That's what we do. Has really very little, it doesn't really affect you. Because remember the manure is, works as a repellent for the cows to eat on the same spot. Now, how deep do we go? As far as we can. Because for me, there's two ways to overgraze. Is staying too long in the same pasture or paddock or returning too soon. And most of the problem that I have seen in most areas is they are doing good rotation, but they are getting too, too soon to the same pattern. Because we're targeting that phase two, and that is really killing a lot of diversity. So this really doesn't affect you for the cows to go back, to go back to the same water. But then what happened after those 10 days, then you pretty much, uh, well, you actually don't have any of these fence anymore and then you put, you put your cows here, and then you keep managing the way you were managing. But that's, that's what we want. We want this experiment. We want this trial. And then we're gonna open some alley so they can go back to the water. That is your homework, folks. If it works, then, oh, you will say, oh no, hold on, I haven't finished. And then you will protect this for a full year. Well, it depends on your context. But for example, in our context, and even though it may work on a 40 inch, but for example, in dry tropics, it was only like 90 days. I think in France, they went from every two months to every four months. And you manage the same way here, but respecting this stuff this time, then that means that you're gonna spend 20 days here. Because we don't want to change the days getting in and out. We only want to intensify the grazing in part of your paddock. And then, uh, then you will give longer rest to this. Longer than what you're doing now. You have a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry, yeah, I, I just guessed. Yeah, you, you do a year where you are, can you translate that to, if, if, if a farm is doing about a 40 day rotation in, in say a six or seven hundred mil rainfall, what, that mm -hmm. would be a year that they'd rest that? No. What, what would it be? Well, it could be, we're not, we don't know. Yes. But, but well, okay, so, so you're asking if you're doing like a 40 day rotation, right? Um, 
on a seven eight hundred uh, six seven hundred millimeters, which is really not that much either. So don't believe what I'm saying. So do a trial from you go from eighty to one hundred and twenty. Another trial from sorry from forty to two hundred and twenty. Another trial from forty to two forty. Do your trials. Because remember, we need to see our properties as a laboratory labs. See, what we're lacking here as we as ranchers, if we're not really trying enough. And remember, the results are once a year. So what are we waiting? How many years do you, know, you have left? So yeah, we need to try like, okay, so I'm gonna try here twice as much as I'm doing, 80, and twice, uh, four times, and eight times. Now see what happened. The key here, is that you need to see more diversity. The whole point of long rest periods is all, well, also stockpiling, you know? Because you tell me, folks, what is easier in a drought? To feed or livestock with a rough grass or no grass at all? Oh, no grass at all, if you're gonna pay that multiple times, right? It's always easier to feed a cow when they still have something to eat. But yeah, do different trials. Yeah, we have, concluded that most of the Western US that range from, again back inches, right? Uh, from let's say in our extreme environment from six inches, but then you go, for example, in Chihuahua, you go to 30 inches. 30 inches on the high mountain range. All, all of us are doing, actually a lot of people are doing 18 months because things are getting really rough, let me tell you. And people now, right now suffering because we only have 50 millimeters so far now as of today. People are selling like everything. I mean, it's, they run out of grass. So, yeah. But for example, going to the US, it could go up to uh, 40 inches and they still are trying on a one year and see what happens. Because we, all we want to do is to create more diversity. If, so compare those truck pilot you're gonna do and say okay this one now don't do your your pilots or trials like one after the other you want to give in the cows a break so you do this here and then you in a different paddock you do another one well depending on the size of your paddocks and then you say okay so I do this here so we need to really be documenting what's going on saying okay this was my area this is how often this is the rest period because let's say that the on a daily moves it depends on what you have in front of you, like how much grass you have. That's how close you're gonna get the paddle, how intensive, but it always depends on what, what is in front of you. Because you're sizing your paddle to meet the, the, the nutritional needs for one day for your herd, for your livestock. Yeah, is that clear? Okay, yes? You've talked about diversity of grasses. Are you including weeds in that? Oh, sorry, diversity of plants. Yeah, the question is, uh, Grasses, no, I'm talking about the plant community. Right, exactly. The plant community, which is everything like, you know, because let me tell you, I was in Montana last year. Let me get a, a drink of water. And they were like bad, like dry spell. And they were full of grasshoppers. And they really hate those grasshoppers. Next morning on the whiteboard, because that was like a two-day deal, I, I put on the whiteboard, let us celebrate that you got a bunch of weeds and grasshoppers. And there were mm, two things that they just hate. <laughs> right? Why? Because you, if you are actually putting more density, like more animal impact on a shorter area, a shorter time, right? Like a daily moves. It will automatically, you know, instead of you staying there for 40 days, now you're talking about one day, right? It's just like exponential, the animal impact that you're going to get. And that combined with a long rest period. So if you happen to have bare ground, you cannot just go from bare ground to nice perennial grasses. You have to respect nature succession. And the first thing that you should see is a bunch of weeds because weeds are healers. Don't kill those weeds. Just be patient. And then you go from bare ground or very low quality grasses 
to a bunch of weeds and then to annuals and then annuals, weeds and perennials until you get it a good stance of perennial grasses and because you're fixing the water cycle then you're going to start seeing these forbs and herbs flowering that they will be way much high in energy and protein than grasses. But no, yeah, we're talking about the whole diversity. So in that picture that you had, where the, you or the man was in the seven foot tall grasses, yes. that had weeds through it as well? Oh yeah. You mean like big ones? <laughs> I thought I saw it. Because I it's, haven't heard you talk about weeds yet. Exactly, because it's quite fertile soil, <laughs> but it was so mismanaged that we only have these grasses like this. But it's like in a valley, so it got a lot of rain, a lot of water, but it actually we were not actually taking advantage. But the weeds were like crazy, were like this thick. And I was even riding my horse and it was like this, like pigweed, that was what we had there. I don't know if you know pigweed, but uh, like amaranthus, but it was huge. So yeah. The, and are you saying part of your philosophy is embrace the weeds? Oh yes. Embrace the weeds. Embrace the weeds. And the stock will eat those weeds? Is that what you're saying? No, okay, well, that, that's a good point. We as ranchers think that if the cow doesn't eat that plant, it's not good. Nature has different plants. Nature may throw, for example, an annual grass or a weed that is not intended to be eaten by the cows, but it is intended to actually heal the soil because, you know, that tap root, right? And then it was, it's pretty interesting when you put the cows there, I'm mean, talking of cows, but could be other animals, put the cows there and they actually stem or step over those all a bunch of weeds, they don't need them. But then you see like if you had a, a cover crop, like it's all full, all the open spots that you have, it's all full. Of, and there's all usually grass underneath. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it's, that's our cover crops, that's our natural cover crops smarter than whatever coral crop we can put on cropland because that's exactly, nature is going to give you exactly what you need at that point in time. And if I may just follow this through long term, is the idea that eventually the weeds stop growing? Is that the idea? Exactly. Because everything gets really healthy, yes. the weeds stop growing? Oh, yes. Right. So in the meantime, should we be out there with our mattocks pulling out big variegated thistles, for example? What is the, the, the recommended approach? Just leave it there. I mean, leave the weeds there, let, let them be. I mean, because they have a purpose to be there, uh, the weeds, and then they will eventually go away. I mean, a lot of things are gonna go away. A lot of things that we see as problems, they will stop being problems. Yeah, so there's no need to kill them. There's no need to, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're not concerned about the number of seeds they produce? I don't concern the number of seeds. Never will be concerned because there's millions of seeds. It's actually the conditions you create that will... See, it's, I see that as probably my IT background, like a keyboard, and saying, okay, nature says, okay, Alejandro, you're here, you need this, 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 I'm, I'm, so I'm going to turn on this. So that's exactly, give you the exact recipe that you need to keep going to the regeneration journey, right? So it's, it's the perfect combination the natural throws to you that what you need on that precise moment in time, either to cover the soil, to open the soil, but that doesn't mean that everything that throws nature on you is going to be eaten by the cows. So just because your cows don't need that specific plant, that doesn't mean that it's a, a bad plant. Yeah. So, well, good questions. Okay, this is a small video. See, remember, we or the size of our paddocks, it depends on what we are seeing in front of us. So this specific paddock has pretty good grasses. So we were able to get probably 300 cows per, per hectare. But if we go into the same paddock and it hasn't rained, it may get lower because you're only sizing how much you need for that cows for one day. For us, it's every 12 hours. So if it doesn't rain, you open up. If it rains and has good rainy season, you close it. It's, it, it, it's very flexible. I was one trying to tell you. I cannot tell you what is the size of your paddocks because it depends on the number you stock. It depends on what you have in front and then and then you actually size the size um, 
size the, 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 the area of that uh, paddock, depending on those particular circumstances at that point in time. It could be too much water. It could be, see, for us, the livestock is driving the whole show. It's not us. One, one guy was asking me in previous home, uh, workshops here in Australia, Alex, well, Alejandro, sorry, I messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do during a drought? Do you leave more grass? Well, the cows will do automatically, right? Because you're not going to force the cows to, to eat the grass that is just... So yeah, automatically the cows leave more grass on a drought. And they will eat, they will, I will go deeper as I have more green and so on. One of the big benefits of long rest periods is at least before when we were rotating three times per year, we got into the paddock that it was this chore, it rained, green up, too much protein, loose manure, watery manure, it started accumulating ammonia, and then you have sickness because you're compromising the immune system like pink eye or things like that. Pink eye doesn't have to do anything with the seeds. It's the immune system that is compromised, not enough, not enough diversity in the cow's diet. So with these long rest periods, when it rains, it rains over all stockpiled grass. So you're seeing the green up among the grass and you are giving the cow the ability to select dry and green, which is a better match diet than a grass that is just growing. So if you see loose manures, like watery manures in your place, that's not a good sign. I mean, obviously it varies, it's kind of indicator only. There will be cows that are smarter to look for those herbs. But in general, if you're losing, if you've seen a lot of watery manure, I think you better do something about it because then in two, three months, it's gonna be a, a health issue. So here, we actually get the paddock smaller because it was better grasses. And then here, I used to have like a polywar. So you just see that there was a pretty good animal impact here. And, oops, probably, it may not work, I don't know. No, it didn't work, well, whatever. So, here is another paddock that after nine months is greening up. This is, this is greening up, no rain, because it took the very deep root system. Now, I, in this particular spot, I used to have alkaline sacaton, which grows on kind of more salty soils. But as we keep managing, this is, this is just gone. You don't see this anymore. You see better grasses here. Because when you are lacking organic matter, the salts just go out. When you start putting a lot of that biology, they get encapsulated again, and then you start gonna have in grasses that are better, because now you don't have grasses that can deal with or plants that have that nature throws there to deal with the salts. Um, okay, have you read that uh, verse? So I was reading that and actually grabbed my attention because I said, well, what do you need to produce milk and honey? Well, milk, you need energy and honey flowers. So I realized that just by looking at the grasses, like going from rancher to grass farmer, it was not enough. I think where we have fixed our water cycle, now we have not only grasses, but also a lot of forbs or flowering herbs, which is actually like in another indicator that you're actually going over the grasslands and now you have a more diversity. Because if we measure the energy and the uh, sugars of a herb, the grass will never be able to compete with, with the four or herb. Plus, the grasses don't have flowers, flowers, right, for bees. So this is, for example, this is pretty good for us, this four, but it only grows among the grass. So once you get well-established grasslands, then you start seeing new forbs coming in, which are gonna be a great complement we measure in uh, Townsville, the bricks of the grasses were like six, and these were like 20, 
Think about it, if you only have grasses, then the diet is gonna be pretty limited. But if you start having more diversity, then you start seeing these guys. Or for example, this, this, this part, you'll see like this is a better water cycle in my ranch and then you have multiple colors. Yes. So they came up naturally? Without yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, good question. Because when Gabe Brown went to my ranch, he said, Alex, he was in Mexico, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he doesn't care. So, yeah, he will never tell, he called me Alejandro. So, he said, I don't see many legumes in your ranch. I mean, obviously there were many forbs. We only found legumes on the edge where it was a bit degraded. It seems like nature is putting extra nitrogen where it actually is degraded to start the process. The other thing is that because, let's say Gabe, Andrea Chuleta and all those guys, uh, they deal with a lot with, uh, with uh, uh, farmland, cropland. They were recommending a lot of the legumes to be put into, but then later on they found out, the same as I can explain you with the cows, like uh, too much green. If you put too many legumes in, 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 your, in your land, and it's, then the microherd is going to sense that and it's going to start eating the carbon in the soil because they are out of balance. And let me give you an example that probably this would be good for you to hear. Where I was in California and this lady attended the workshop and he said to me, um, Alex, um, Alejandro, sorry, I got a little confused. Can you go to my ranch to give us a talk? Actually, I ended up giving the talk in Spanish because most people working there is Mexicans. And they are having an issue with the sheep because she actually grows uh, organic almonds, but she wanted to be regen organic almonds. So she actually put something below the trees, you know, like grasses, and then sheep on it. So the sheep were eating the bark of some trees and killing those young trees. So I asked the shepherd, okay, so when you turn in those sheep, how is the manure? Is it solid manure or is it kind of loosey watery? And he told me, yeah, many times it's watery. Okay, that's a problem because he was turning the sheep into very immature grass. When you do that, then the sheep is gonna automatically go for carbon. And where is it expanded carbon? On the bark, right? So I just said, okay, you gotta wait more. Let, let, let the grass mature, put some seeds, and then you can graze it. The other question was, how many sheep were eating the bar? Many, not many, sell them. See, most problems we have as livestock producers come from nutrition and selection, guys. We have that powerful tool to select what we really need. And we can talk about that. Um, I thought I was done with the whiteboard, but no, I think there's one more concept. Uh, questions? Oh my God, you're like the faster of the old west. So please. Uh, so you don't give any supplements at all to your livestock, only the sea salt? Not anymore. I think once I reach a point that, see, I start like reducing, reducing until until we got to a point through better nutrition and selection, okay. which is the topic, yeah. Um, so yeah, well, well, sorry, the question was if I was giving um, any supplements, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we used to, like for seven months, eight months, we used to. Then it got reduced into less and less and less until we were year round with no uh, supplements, yeah. In the case, for example, let's go up north, Cape Brown, big storms you know, snowstorms, he went from, let's say, six months of hay to one month of hay. Now, he actually selected for cattle that can actually drink from the snow. So he turned off all the water system and then the cows. So it's, well, I'm glad you asked with that because it's all about nutrition and selection. Yeah. Huh? What else here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, just talking about properties in the Adelaide Hills, the Mount Lofty Ranges, not the big open rangeland station country. Most people here are farming on less than 500 acres, so locking up paddocks, you're going to have a lot of paddocks still coming to seed at the same time because of a very short growing season. Right. And most of us um, cut hay, 
to feed out in the coldest time of the year and the area and the hottest time where there's no feed on the ground. Because there's no feed because, yeah, it, you, as you say, you've, you've exemplified it. But how to do that with everything coming to sea at the same time? Oh, no, we, we had the same challenge because we take so long to go back and because it's only three months of rain that everything just sits. Yeah. But that's what we want. We want, the, we want the grass to actually go and put a seed on it. But it's actually the diversity and also you start extending the green season. There's always, even in the dry area and the dry season or the cold season, there's always something green for the cow to eat. The thing you need to adjust there is the size of your paddocks because the less green, the bigger the paddock has to be. Right, you agree with me? For example, we went to an area that I have a mountain range and then a slope and then the flats or the bottoms. And that slope is very difficult to regenerate because of the speed of the water coming from the mountain range. And this year we were able to grow a lot of, well last year, a lot of annual grass. So when we get into the mountain range, the grass was green. So the cows eat them all, all the annual grass because it was green. On our way back, because after the rains, it was all dry. And it was kind of uh, interesting because, oh, I say to my foreman, oh, you didn't eat any of this grass, right? No, the cows didn't, didn't want it. I'm okay with that. I just almost skipped the paddock because perhaps nature's intent was just to cover the soil with something. Yeah, not for the cows to eat something that naturally they wouldn't eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we are, we are actually trying to get, or our goal is to get 200 different grasses and 200 different forbs. We don't manage anymore for a few grasses or a few forbs. Oh, there we go, that works. So you see like a lot of life, I mean butterflies and birds and all kind of things. So excuse me to interrupt, but this is not a common sight. We drive around, I don't see colourful flowers on people's farms, unless it's yellow cake or purple, whatever it was. <laughs> 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 am, I, am I missing something here? Is the point that this is a very, very different way that has yet to catch on? And as it catches on, we should see a changing landscape around us. Is, is that, the that, is, that is correct, yes, that is correct, yeah. Because it's not even common in my place. Well, if you will see, for example, my ranch may not be the best ranch in the area because there are really good grazers there. But when you go through my ranch, it's just like, oh my God. Like I remember when they were filming Sacred Cow and it was Diana Rogers driving from Boston, think about it, from Boston to the desert. And she was really very disappointed when we were driving to the ranch because he was scared about so, many, so much background. And she told me, Alejandro, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I say, oh, I'm glad that you have such a low expectations because when we get to the branch, it's gonna get better. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, she was excited about what she saw. But yeah, this spot and many other spots is when we actually got the water cycle better. And then, and then you, 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 you should see actually more life, more colors, more not only grasslands. But most of the problem with this is because we are rotational overgrazing. No rotational grazing, rotational grazing most of the pastures, yeah. And if you are getting too soon, then your grasses are going to be very shallow rooted and you will really never going to be able to fix the water cycle to get more uh, herbs, growing herbs or palatable to um, your livestock or bees. Uh, have you, are you familiar with the refractometer? Yeah. It's commonly used, for example, in sugarcane or vine yards or even in agave as well. Uh, but it's also useful for us folks to have that uh, metric or baseline. Or This is what it does for us. Think about this. As you increase the BRICS level, which actually ties back to the microbiology and the water cycle, your daily gains for your livestock are going to increase. This is a huge benefit. We're talking only about grasses here, but if you have diversity of more forbs, you're talking about that forb has 2D bricks and the grass has 10, is that combination of that allowing the cow to select that is gonna help you a lot. Another very uh, important thing about the bricks is that 
it depending where you are at the scale that it will be at some point like at 12 and more that you will have no problem with the insects or disease. Obviously, some of these concepts not only apply to rangeland but also cropland or orchards and so on. Um, okay, so how are we doing with the time, guys? Oh, sorry. Rowena? How much more time? Three minutes? 30 minutes. Okay. More. <laughs> you know, when I, when I came to Australia, I was like um, very formal and serious until I got these uh, Aussie ladies that were teasing me, pulling my leg, and I was, oh my God, okay, I know what I need to do here. I need to put up a defense here because they're going to eat me alive. So I remember when the bird guys came and they actually told me, uh, Alejandro, we have a product that is going to kill all this creosote because it has an allopathic effect that is not letting the grass grow. And I told them right away, if you come here to the ranch, you got to bring things that will promote life, not kill life. So I, I think the message here, folks, is to work for what you want. We spend too much time working for what we don't want. Like Gabe Brown said in his book, every morning I wake up to see what I have to kill. <laughs> right? That, I mean, we were that way. We had this local wheat that actually get the livestock kind of crazy, and horses, and I don't know what donkeys, I didn't have donkeys at that time, but... And we were every year spending, killing, and, uh, uh, but we never changed the management. The foundation is always a good grazing management. But... Then I say, yeah, let's focus what we want. Boop, the grass grow among those. The good thing about here is that the grass really never read the book. <laughs> you know that, yeah, you cannot grow there. Yeah, it will grow there. Uh, these were our winters, folks. Pretty tough winter. We were supplementing like eight months per year. See, very uh, oxidized grass, a lot of bare ground. Now, these are our winters today. It does really make a lot of difference. Uh, let's say that you are driving toward the ranch and then you go right before my ranch to this ranch. And we are getting the same precipitation, same day. See the difference. It's just impressive. While my Nero is still <coughs> praying for more rain, I'm done with that. See, that's, that's really so important for you. For us, the best insurance for, uh, against drought is a good grazing management. Uh, this is, for example, in the spring. And then this, is, this side is my fence. This side is my neighbor fence. So if you see here, I already have some. That's why we actually strive to have perennial base. So the green is actually growing and his grasses are sick because of the lack of animal impact. If you go and drive to the western US, or actually northern Mexico, the problem with the certification nowadays is not anymore over grazing, it's over resting the plants. There's not enough cattle to revert this trend of, of the certification. Unfortunately, because I work a lot with the conservationists, and the first thing they say is, oh, if they see this, oh, you have too many animals, this talk. So then the same spot, the same spot in summer. See how much grass I was able to grow versus my neighbor, and I'm running five times more cattle than my neighbor. <laughs> it's not the number of cattle, it's how you manage that cattle that will actually help you grow more and better grasses and hopefully more uh, herbs or forbs. Okay, this is interesting guys. Uh, so, you have like these grasses here. 
right? And also, we have something in common with the Aussies. We, try, we like to uh, tease and play. So I asked these PhDs in grasses, oh, you mind telling me to help me identify these grasses? And they say, oh, yeah, this is Tobosa grass. How about this? Oh, we have never seen this. It's the same, folks. But the different management, this is again in winter, my neighbor, and my place. Think just about what we refer to the leaf to stem ratio. So the same grass that you have in your station or your property has to evolve to have more leaves. Why is that? Because as you feed more the macro herb, the macro herb is gonna grow. And it's going to ask the plant, hey, I need a bigger solar panel. You better put more leaves. So this will be always a better feed for the uh, micro herd, for our livestock, for life, for live, uh, wildlife. And this is just struggling, you know. So just watch out for that ratio between the leaf and uh, we, we want more leafy grasses. Noticing any methane differences between the two? Methane differences? Yeah, the amount of methane that the cattle are in. Oh, well, we haven't really, uh, if, if I notice a difference in me methane, uh, no, we haven't really measured that. We have never measured that, no. Yeah, kind of, we don't believe much on that, but, well, yeah. But, um, yes? I noticed your boundary says Average. <laughs> 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 the, light way, right? so the fact that you use electric fencing for your strip raising, does that make them more respectful of dodgy fences? <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. I mean, if they, by using electric fence, if they respect the, more the conventional fence, yeah. no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I mean, it's always easier to stop our livestock with just one uh, high tensile wire electric. No, no, actually, because, you know, we're building smaller paddles, sometimes our fences are, let's start doing like conventional fences like this. <laughs> so, yeah, no, we haven't really seen, um, actually, you know, what, what does happen is, that, yeah, the cattle are way more tame, yeah. like more docile than before. Oh, yeah, they are almost like pets now. Because when you go, see, okay, I think we still have time for that. Um, where's the... The eraser. Um, oh yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit because we're not go over the genetics, but let's talk now that I remember about the genetics. So the genetics are really very important, folks, because I'm gonna ask you a question. And be honest. Who do you work for? Do you work for your best cows? Do you work for the one in the middle, or do you work for the worst cows? we ended up working for the world's cows, right? Even when we are sizing a paddock, we're always looking for the worst. That's like a friend of mine who was rotating three times, you know, on his uh, wagon wheel, and he convinced his father, well, his father is Jesus, he convinced his father, hey, we need to move on to something else that, okay, do it. But he was a bit too aggressive on his grazing, like just too much. Because remember, every day, the, the livestock is going to give you a feedback how good you did last previous day. Are they tranquil? Are they happy? Are they full? Okay, we're doing bad. If they are not, open up. So he happened to have, remember, I'm not leaning towards any specific breed. So to get like, oh, Alejandro likes this or is selling this or that. No. So he got, he happened to have uh, a fewer red beef master cows and a bunch of black Black Angus cows, obviously the beef master had more selection to the years. And then he, he told me, hey, Alejandro, uh, come and take a look at what I'm doing. And I look at his red cows. Oh my God, they look really nice. The black cows were almost going to die. <laughs> and I told Juan Pablo, my friend, hey, Juanpa, if you had only red cows, I would say, oh my God, what a good job you're doing. But because your black cows are almost dying, you have to open up. And he opened up right away. I mean, he actually extended that, you know, that paddock. So really, if you think about it, we ended up working for those poor performers. 
So what we do at the branch actually is if you see any like a normal distribution, like a bell curve, right? Any population. So here we have the the like the low performing cows, and then we have here the average, and then we have like the top. So when we go and move the livestock, we want to have control over that livestock, certain control, like don't stand up, don't rush into the gate, as long as we provide enough feed, right? Otherwise they will rush until we tell them to move. But we take that time to observe and try to get rid of these cows by looking at the body condition, the hair coat, it probably has a dinky calf. Dinky calf, how you say dinky calf here? Like cow that is calf that is lagging behind? Yeah? You understand what I'm saying? No? Yes? Maybe? Okay. Or maybe that cow aborted something. There was a problem with that cow. With that cow. Then we brought out the numbers. So let's say that I define in my place that is like I'm going to get rid of those, like 24%. Obviously, it could go up during a drought. And then I have the top, they said that they are 16%. And then this is like the, what, 60, right? Yeah? Good, my God, I passed that math is. Hey. <laughs> okay, so. If it's 24% and we're calling like twice a month, right? So we're calling 1% every two weeks to reach that goal. So what, what does it do? It keeps your heart clean. So you will make better decisions. That's why my, my neighbor actually went to me and he said, hey, I'm disappointed because of my dad came and he saw 20 poor performing cows out of 500 and he told me, you're doing, you're doing a poor job. And I told my neighbor, I don't have that problem. Why? Because those 20 cows are back on the mountain range. My dad, my dad cannot see those cows. <laughs> and he said, oh, you're cheating. <laughs> no, that is my management. I don't want to have those cows dragging. Plus, my dad will not see him, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what we do is, it's just one-way decision. There's no, there's no point back. I mean, before, oh, help the cow, get it back on track, and get it back to the herd. No, we don't do that anymore. It's just a one-time decision that it, it goes to the butcher. But before it goes, because we have so many paddocks that are like stockpile, that you throw those few cows, to those paddocks and they now they're not competing there and they bounce back but because you're calling them often then you don't let them get into a point that is going to have more costly to get them back so we're constantly calling these guys so we are at that point where we're wearing our predator hat when we're done with that then make could be a noise or the reel and then the cows know that now it's time to move but the cows that way allow us to see a quick look of the whole herd and see who is not doing well. And then what we do with the top, well, we get the genetics back to her, the herd. We buy a few bulls, but most of our bulls are home raised. From let's say we look at the we look at the herd here. And those cows are actually looking good, good body condition, nice uh, shiny hair coat in the spring or summer, and then a good bull calf that looks like a bull and behaves like a little bull. Then if we need 30, then, or let's say we know if we need 20, then we tag 40. And during branding, we got the first cut. During, uh, on winners, the second cut, and that's it. So those are the bulls that are, and that's how we are actually promoting. I know some people, and I know that they will say, oh, how about inbreeding? Well, inbreeding is when it doesn't work, and lamb breeding when it does work. 
use just I, or like would you take the weights? Do you use any measurements? Is it you subjective do? or objective? Or oh no, just by I, yeah. Just yeah, I. yeah, yeah, you learn like linear measurements, like Gerald Fry? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we study a lot of Gerald Fry um, uh, on, the, on the linear measurements, but actually, as Gerald said, you know, all what you're doing with all this training is to train your eye eventually, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, now, as you advance, it's going to become more difficult, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, it's going to become more difficult because... Well, that's a good point. You, did, you didn't stay there, right? You get better. You give me hope, though. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. So, and then we still buy a few bulls, but we're very careful where we're buying the bulls, you know, because the bull can really take you back again, calving issues. And some people tell me, so what if you get this with the, with the uh, inbreeding, some weird things? And I say, well, there is really not much, not such a bad thing, because in Mexico, we had the tradition of making ovens. I think you, someone told me that it's, I don't know, you will know. On a hole, like a hole on the ground. Hanging. Huh? They call it hanging. Hanging. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're as, as well as that. So. so, and then in northern Mexico, you put like a, because northern Mexico is more cattle, you put the, the head and they eat the cheek and all that stuff, right? Central Mexico, they put lamb and not, uh, southern Mexico put pork. So, if you happen actually to have like a two head, <laughs> then you have twice. <laughs> Right? So it's not that bad though. Okay guys, so I just wanted to explain this to you. How we do it with the promoting the good genetics and actually not letting the herd um, slip away with uh, my dad getting mad at it. Uh, keep going. Good. Okay, you tell me. So, the leaf to stem ratio. To stem ratio. Now, who's going to eat this stuff? I got the donkeys. I have a donkeys because there was a study in Kenya where the pastoralists were complaining about the zebras with livestock, you know? And then it came to this uh, Duke University and tried to do the study, but the Kenya didn't allow wildlife to be and part of the research, so they put donkeys. They put a bunch of donkeys, so it was like 30% donkeys, 70% uh, cattle. Cattle do way much better uh, uh, on that combination than the control, which was only livestock. Way much better, like a high percentage, much higher percentage of pregnancy rate, and also on, on daily gains with the combination. So remember, we're trying to mimic nature. Why, if nature has so many species and we are trying to do everything with a cow or with a sheep or whatever we have? So what the donkeys are doing is exactly this. The donkeys, they just don't care what they're eating and they just, boom, cut it. Oh, but you're gonna pull the roots. Well, yeah, it's gonna pull the roots if your grasses are weak, but they will never be able to pull a root system like in this grass, which is the same grass, but different conditions. So the donkeys are really helping us to kind of get into that low quality and then that way we allow the cow to be more selective instead of trying to force the cow to eat the stems. And this is the same grasses. See, see how shallow was this grass? And I would never be able to actually pull this grass from a ranch. Uh, they said in a different uh, early spring season, driving to this. So the first, the first uh, property that I drive was like a pretty much set stocking. See how much loss has been lost, even the mesquite is dying. Then I went to my neighbor and then I went to my property. Even the colors really tell you a story. We talk about this, remember I told you, we can all jump from I have some friends that go to the ranch and they start grabbing all the seeds from that seven feet tall grass. And I say, yeah, that was not expensive, that's fine. Oh, really, where do you buy it? Well, no, I'm just teasing you, I didn't buy it. <laughs> the point is that we still believe that the same as weeds, right? That we're concerned about, oh, you're leaving all the weeds? How about all those seeds? Don't worry, if you create the conditions, they will not germinate. 
Once you've got the grass established, all the weeds are just going to be dormant because then there's conditions that are not occurring anymore. But, yeah, so, it, it, I mean, what is the point of grabbing disease if you haven't created the conditions for that grass to germinate? So this, this is one of the few pictures that I actually took like on the same spot. So this is the reference. We call it the elephant butte. So it was bare ground here. When you have a lot of bare ground, we try to combine that with, a, with another paddock that has grass. That, because I really have seen the cows, they go and need the grass one, in one place and they actually put them in the air where there's no grass. So the cows really know how to grow feet for next year, if we allow them to. And then um, in three years, we start having more weeds. And then in another three years, now we have grasses. And that was a more intensive grazing combined with longer periods. Mm -hmm. Questions? Is that the same time of year each time? Say, sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, yes, yeah, try, yes. Uh, the question is, if it was the same time uh, of the year, yeah. Yeah, you always try to do the, your measurements, including the bricks, because the bricks, it will be different. Obviously, it has to have, you know, the sunlight, the, the bricks, to, to measure the bricks, but also the bi biology is gonna be more active during the rainy season for the bricks than on the dry season. Yeah, so we always try to take pictures at the same time of the year. Perhaps it's not exactly the same day, but you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why we need to extend a little bit those pictures. So we give at least three years because of the average rains. Yeah, so we don't take that high rainfall or that. Yeah, but yeah, the answer is, uh, yeah, they are the same on the same time of the year, correct. What sort of bricks ratings are you getting on your grasses now? Uh, we're getting about nine. Uh, we're getting, uh, yeah, the question is how, what was the breaks on the grasses, about nine. Mm -hmm. But because we have more diversity, yeah. more force, more uh, of these. See, the funny thing is when you, when you try to find the name of those forests that I show you, those herbs, they always say prairie something, prairie something. So they only grow when there's grass. Um, yeah, about nine, but also those forests are like about 20 something. So it's really that combination. Obviously, we don't have the same forests through the year. We have uh, obviously more herbs during the spring, but also in fall. Hmm? So we're still really discovering a lot of stuff. I mean, new plants and when the bird guys go and do the transects, they don't even know what grasses we have. They've never seen it. Mm -hmm. What were your bricks levels in the first time? What were the breaks? They were like the average, like four. Like most places that you go, uh, even Western US, North Mexico, they're about four. Here, one wedding we had was like six, but also we went to a different station and it went like 15, but it was like a very uh, in the growing, growing. So yeah, growing stage, probably phase two. Uh huh. Have you grows a they have well, uh, the question is if I have grazed a paddock. If you've got a bare paddock, how can you graze an intensive Oh, like uh, too much? Do you mean? I'm not following well, the I question. Think that's already there. I think you said the answer was you made sure that you combine it with an area with. That had some feed. Oh, that, like we don't have, let's say, that we find a paddock that has not much to graze. Yeah. yeah, we try to combine it. Otherwise, I mean, if you have very little, then you just have to make the paddock as big as necessary. So you may not have much, uh, you may not have uh, much density, but it's still a big change going from 30 days on a paddock to daily moves. Yeah, because, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of, some of my friends use like a bell racing as well, like they put bells. But, but most people doing that is because they have farmland as well, cropland. For us it's not uh, convenient because it's too far, very costly to carry those. So we better go for the slow pace, waiting to something to just start growing.
Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that when you say, oh, you know, I'm a regen rancher now, I'm ready. Yes, you may be ready, but your land is not, your, your land is just going down. So that's what we call sometimes the misery years, you know, that you have to go through those. But the important thing is for you to keep the business going. And that's why we are so, put so much emphasis on war, on first, on the base, most productive areas. And then, I understand there will be areas that will still be ready because you're focusing on that. But focusing on those areas will actually help us to save the whole thing or to make it profit more faster or for you not to get disappointed about, oh, it's been five years, I throw this investment, I don't see anything done. Because we all have bosses, right? Either the kids or the wife or the partner or so on, so on, so on, so on, or the husband. So we need to get those results as fast as possible. Yes? Some of this land looks similar to like north of Wilpena in South Australia. Have you had anybody up there try that? Sort of? Mm. Is there any people in Australia well, at the moment? There is yet. Yeah. No. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, yeah, actually, in, in many of the workshops, there were people that actually were glad to hear that, but they were already doing something. It was like a, a more like a something like added value, but oh, yeah, I mean, you really have really a good, great uh, grazers here in Australia. Uh huh. Yep. Agree? You're one of them? <laughs> yes, sir. Do a similar job to donkeys? Goats, yeah. Um, I think they will do, uh, the, the goats will do similar to the, to the uh, donkeys, but it's just that I don't, I don't really need to take care of the, goat, the donkeys. They just fit really well into the current infrastructure of the cows, plus they protect the cows uh, against coyotes. See, the, the thing is that why are we striving to get just one mob? See, in one mob, one herd, I have my saddle horses that I'm not using, I have the mares, I have the donkeys, I have the livestock of all ages. Because we have mountain lions, like pumas, right? I don't know how you pull cougars, pumas, mountain lions. And they like to have multiple cows all across. And when we were weaning, like, you know, getting the, to the corrals or the mammoth, oh my God, we were feeding those mountain lions. So we really have to have a, that one mob. So we started experimenting with different ways of winning, okay, so we get rid of that, then fence line, fence line winning, and then, but still, the, the winners were in a different pasture, getting down by the mountain lions. Then we tried the nose rings, I don't know how you call those. It worked, but sometimes we got find those uh, stuck into mesquite or something, or ripping off the nose. So we said, okay, let's raise the bar for the cows. Now we're going to be asking the cows to win, self win. And then, yeah, now the majority of our cows are self winning the calves. So you actually notice right away. I mean, like, in a way, boom, because they already kicked the calf. The problem obviously is with the open cows, because they don't got that sensitivity, you know, that, okay, I need to get rid of this guy. But you know, anyway, they just go to town. But um, yeah, so we try to keep just that one big mob. Sorry, yes, ma'am. If you also run horses, don't you have a problem with lungworm and the donkeys? Host, host the lungworm to affect the horses. Well, well, if we have a problem with the uh, the worms, right? Uh, no, we haven't really seen any of the issues. Uh, I think a lot of the issues we see is because uh, probably our soils are really not that good yet. And then we go back to what I told you is like, okay, uh, let's do, well, horses to begin with, I think probably through years of selection, they may lose body condition way, way much easier than a donkey. So that's why I really like donkeys because they actually can take pretty low quality stuff. But still, we still run the horses with the, very rarely there are times where we need to saw them out, the horses, not the donkeys, the horses, because they're losing body condition. Uh, we, we, we give them a holiday and then we, they get back. Because we really love to have everything just one 
place. Because as things get rough, you will be thankful that everything is just in one place. Do yes? The, do the donkeys stay within the single high tensile wire? Oh yeah, the, yeah the, uh, the question is the donkeys stay on the same, yeah. Well, when we bought the donkeys, my horses and cows have never seen a donkey, yeah. and everybody ran to the different directions. <laughs> So the donkeys took on the mountain range. We got lo we lost them on the mountain range because you know to get a donkey out of the mountain range on a horse is impossible. So and and that's where we actually grow the mountain lions. So zero problem with the mountain lions taking down a donkey. And then at a point where the donkeys went down for water, my foreman took them, get them back, everything set down, and they find it. Now they miss being with the cows. So yeah, they, they actually are like in the same uh, herd, yeah. Uh, yes? Do you run your bulls full time then? Oh, no, no, yeah. If I run my bulls all the time, no. We have a breeding season. Why do we have a breeding season? Because the coyotes. One of the benefits of a long rest period is, let's say we have four families or five families of coyotes at the ranch. They are territorial, so we're fighting coyotes with coyotes. If I don't have an issue with coyotes, I don't kill the coyotes because they will invite all the coyotes that are troublemakers into my area. But because we have these long rest periods that we may be hitting the same family a year after, and they were forcing the coyotes to get used to go and hunt, not hunt my cows, but hunt. Obviously, sometimes, you know, the cow mess it up, it didn't go back to the... Because we never stop the movement. We move twice a day, and if they are calving, we keep moving. We just go on during calving early on. So we try to get the pairs, I mean the cow-calf. Uh, otherwise, we always move like at 10 a.m. Because why 10 a.m.? Because that's when the breaks are already up, and then they will get that benefit. But with, it, with those long rest periods, actually you are forcing those families to actually live off something else. And because we never hit the same paddle, the same time of the year, that you shouldn't either. Because if you are hitting the same paddle, the same time of the year every year, you're only promoting certain plants. So yeah, that does help. And yeah, otherwise, otherwise we will be calving and then we will feed in the coyotes. Yeah, the coyotes. You, you said you had 300 sheep. You put it what are you doing with the sheep? Oh no, well, uh, yeah, we have 350 sheep. No, 349, one was, <laughs> no, just kidding. So, um, we have a very detailed plan for the sheep. I, it, it doesn't really, I don't really have enough time to explain how we manage the sheep. And the plan is that the sheep can go wherever they want. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the, well, let's get serious. So, the thing is that, um, we have three houses and three corrals across the ranch, and that's how we do with, with the sheep. They always go and be around the cows, front, back, back. But then when we move the cow to, cows to another uh, block or section, then the, the, the shepherd and the guard dogs go to that other corral, and he lives there, and so on. Yeah, so they're always fat, because they're pretty selective. Yes. But I like... Uh, um, so they're all together? Oh yes, they're all together. Well, nearby, yeah. yeah. But you got the plan, yeah. the specific plan, detail, specific, specific plan. Yeah, you, you understand that? <laughs> Just don't kidding. Okay. Um, how are we doing? Lunch time. Good. Let's take a break, guys.